the Arctic today is no longer the endless, frozen white landscape you might imagine. In the latest NASA satellite images, you can actually see lush green and wet patches of vegetation. In just 70 years, 100,000 beavers have expanded their territory all the way to the edge of the Bering Sea, creating a network of dams and ponds with over 13,000 ponds, about as many as there are in all of Switzerland. Hard to believe, right? But it's absolutely true. In fact, these beavers are melting billions of tons of ice to create warm oases that hold water and heat, help young trees grow, let baby fish survive, and even help the land withstand droughts and wildfires. But at the same time, there's a hidden threat. To understand why these rodents have made it to the Arctic and what changes they're bringing, we need to go back to the 1940s. At the end of the 19th century, North American beavers were on the brink of extinction. If you've watched our beaver documentaries, you'll know their disappearance has been covered in detail, so let's keep it brief here. When the beaver pelt trade exploded in the 17th and 18th centuries, hunters scoured forests and rivers from Canada all the way to the southern United States. Beaver pelts became a symbol of wealth used for hats and cloaks. The consequences were devastating from a population of about 60 million spread across the continent. By the late 1800s, there were only about 100,000 left, a 99% drop. Many areas once full of beaver dams dried up, riverbanks cracked, and fish and water birds vanished. Some naturalists at the time feared beavers would go extinct just like the passenger pigeon. It wasn't until the 1940s that scientists truly recognized beavers as ecosystem engineers, the only species that could create wetlands, hold groundwater filter rivers, and even protect mangrove forests. With this realization, reintroducing and protecting beavers became an urgent priority. But as you might guess, humans, and these rodents, haven't always lived in harmony. To build dams, beavers cut down trees, block streams, and turn little creeks into wetland paradises for themselves. But nightmares for people who want dry land for homes and roads. As Americans moved deeper into the forests in the 1930s, the Idaho Department of Fish and Game saw conflicts getting worse. Killing beavers wasn't the answer, so the agency had to find another way to relocate the beavers to more suitable remote places. And the Arctic turned out to be the perfect spot. But as we all know, no people means no roads. Back then, infrastructure was far from modern, so this process wasn't easy. Imagine being one of the Idaho beaver conservationists. Trappers had to catch each beaver, put them on trucks, let them rest overnight, then transfer them to another vehicle, and finally tie them onto horses or mules to cross rugged mountain terrain. Sounds exhausting, doesn't it? Every transfer meant more stress. Beavers don't handle heat well and need constant water to cool down. If they get thirsty, they stop eating and quickly become exhausted. Meanwhile, the mules and horses were terrified of carrying heavy, struggling passengers, making the whole trip dangerous. Many trips were expensive and ended in bitter failure. By the time they arrived, only a few beavers had survived. Elmo Hedder, a veteran at Idaho Fish and Game, wrote bluntly in a 1950 report, we spent too much time and money only to end up with dead beavers on the backs of horses. After months of failed relocations by horse and truck, Idaho conservationists knew they needed a whole new solution. Post-World War II brought a strange opportunity surplus airplanes cheap fuel, but still no roads in the wilderness. One fall morning in 1948, as the sun rose, a twin-engine Beechcraft Travel Air sat ready on a dirt runway. In its cargo hold were eight wooden crates carrying special passengers, the first beavers about to become parachuting pioneers of nature. At first, the idea sounded crazy. How could you parachute beavers without turning the plane into a chaotic prison? They tried weaving willow baskets so the beavers could chew their way out after landing. But as soon as the beavers were put inside, they started gnawing like mad. No one wanted to fly with dozens of angry, sharp-toothed prisoners. So Idaho Fish and Game engineers designed a special wooden crate. Two boxes joined like a suitcase with one-inch air holes and a complex strap system that would pop open on impact. For testing, they chose a tough volunteer, 
Geronimo, an old male beaver. Elmo Hedder recalled, Each time we dropped him into a meadow, Geronimo would be picked up, put back in the box, and go again. Eventually, whenever he saw people, he'd climb into the box himself, ready to fly. Geronimo helped determine the ideal drop height between 490 and 787 feet to avoid trees, but still let the parachute open safely. When everything was ready, the first flights took off. Over several days, 76 beavers were parachuted into the Chamberlain Basin, a remote roadless area where beaver activity would help restore the land. The survival rate was nearly perfect, only one beaver died after escaping too soon. The beavers were dropped in groups of one male and three females, as recommended by fur inspectors, to help them quickly form colonies. By the time you're watching this documentary, the descendants of those 76 parachuting beavers are still thriving in the Chamberlain Basin. But as time passed, technology advanced, and the way beavers were moved changed too. These days, there are no more nerve-wracking parachute drops. Conservationists use helicopters to move beavers into the wild in just a few hours much faster and safer than the old Beechcraft flights. You can imagine the difference from self-opening wooden crates hitting the ground to smooth helicopter rides from risky experiments to professional standards. But traditions haven't disappeared completely. In September 2023 in Utah, people witnessed a scene straight out of the past, a caravan of horses quietly crossing a dry valley, carrying wooden crates filled with live beavers. This wasn't just nostalgia. It was an urgent effort to bring beavers to headwater streams to fight drought and wildfires threatening the American West. Back to our beaver story, the Arctic once home, only to polar bears, caribou narwhals, and ringed seals has gained a new neighbor in recent decades, the beaver. It all started when a group of tough pioneering beavers quietly headed north, crossing icy fields and frozen tundra. Researchers even tell an amazing story. One beaver traveled so far that the skin under its flat tail was worn bare a testament to the long, harsh journey. Today, the descendants of those trailblazers have built countless dams and ponds across Alaska and Canada. Their numbers keep rising, creating a migration wave never seen before in this species. As the climate warms and permafrost melts, beavers are moving north, seizing a golden opportunity. And wherever they go, the landscape is reshaped almost overnight. New dams, new ponds, and warm oases springing up on once frozen ground. You might be surprised since beavers in the wild usually seem slow and hate moving. But in reality, the urge to migrate is deep in their DNA. After turning two years old, young beavers leave their families wander for one or two years, settle in new areas, and quickly start breeding. Generation by generation, beavers have pushed their range from the taiga forests, where they relied on wood for dams, and lodges further and further north into the Arctic. Want to know how the Arctic has changed since these ecosystem engineers arrived? Photos from the 1950s show the Alaskan tundra as a blanket of pure white ice with no beaver ponds at all. But when scientists compared high-resolution satellite images from 2006 to 2020, they were stunned to spot over 11,377 new beaver pond. Black dots scattered across the white snow like ink on paper. In the Kotzbeer region, the number of beaver dams exploded from just two in 2002 to 98 in 2019, almost 50 times more in just 17 years. On the Baldwin Peninsula, researchers recorded 94 dams in 2010, rising to 409 by 2019 as spread some experts call an underwater wildfire. Across northern and western Alaska, there are now an estimated 50,000 to 100,000 beavers, with at least 56 new pond clusters formed since 1999, bringing the total mapped ponds in the Western Arctic to about 12,000 to 13,000. Meanwhile, the far northern tundra of Alaska is still pure white clear proof that the beavers' new frontier is still expanding every year. The rise of beavers in the Arctic is writing a story that's both magical and controversial with huge ecological impacts. 
On one hand, beaver dams and ponds turn frozen ground into warm oases, where deep water holds heat year-round, keeping permafrost from reaching the surface. The result, shrubs and wetland grasses grow quickly. Migratory birds find new stopovers, insects boom, and even boreal forest species like willow and dwarf pine start creeping into what used to be endless snow. Imagine thousands of deep blue ponds appearing across the tundra like thousands of tiny central parks scattered across the far north. But not everyone is happy. Many indigenous communities worry these dams could block the migration routes of Dolly Varden, an Arctic salmon that's a key food source and part of their culture. If the fish can't get up the streams, we lose our way of life, a fisherman in Kotzebue shared. Just one dam a few feet high can change water levels and make it hard for salmon to spawn a real concern. But biologists offer reassuring evidence. Most beaver dams are on small side streams not blocking the main channels. In fact, they create winter nurseries ponds that don't freeze over where young coho salmon can hide and grow safely. Believe it or not, the Arctic is changing at an unbelievable pace, even without beavers. Temperatures here have risen twice as fast as the global average melting ice, quickly shortening winters and forcing the whole ecosystem to adapt. Scientists predict many species from salmon to large mammals will gradually move north to find new habitats. And that's already happening. Moose once found only in the taiga have expanded into the tundra, where shrubs and young grass now grow thanks to warmer ground. Many bird species are breaking their traditional migration schedules returning earlier to catch the snow melt. Imagine a whole new ecological picture is taking shape with the old seasonal rhythms completely upended. In that picture, beavers are a special factor. They don't just change the landscape, they directly impact people's lives. At Serpentine Hot Springs in Bering Land Bridge National Park, Alaska, a beaver dam built in 2021 raised water levels, threatening to flood the area's only airstrip. The managers came up with a smart solution, install a drain pipe through the dam, keeping water levels safe while letting the beavers stay a clear sign that people and beavers can coexist if we find the right balance. Today, Alaska still allows beaver hunting, but their rapid population growth shows this isn't a long-term solution. Instead of trapping or hunting scientists and indigenous communities have created the Arctic Beaver Observation Network using satellite data and field surveys to monitor every dam and pond searching for wise ways to manage beavers without destroying the ecosystem. So what do you think about the invasion of beavers? Is it a threat or a new chance for the Arctic to be reborn? Share your thoughts in the comments and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss more amazing nature stories.